the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. Today we're going to be continuing our return series. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with them with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their wicks. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourself. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready, shout ready. And those who were ready went with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. You can be seated. Today we will be continuing our series on the return during which we will be discussing some unique texts, whether they be parable or prophetic, to see what the Scripture has to say regarding the return of the Lord. Today's passage may seem to be a strange parable of these ten virgins awaiting the coming of the bridegroom, but church family, it was Christ himself that shared this parable with the intent of giving us insight regarding what we should do or perhaps rather see the value of spiritually preparing for if the bridegroom were to delay his coming. And it is these specific insights that I would like to share with all of us this morning in hopes that church we would choose today not tomorrow not next week not when we feel like it not whenever things are better but we will choose today to get prepared to make sure that we have oil for our lamps ask you ask your neighbor do you have the oil do you have the oil with, with that said point number one today the ten virgins all saw the need for the lamps but not all ten virgins saw the value of the all. I want you to notice with me verses 1 through 4 found in this passage of text. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. One point in this parable that I feel is extremely important that we need to give attention to, but all 10 of these noted characters were virgins. They were holy. They were set apart. They had not given their purity away. They saw the value of protecting their value. Church, holiness is still right. How we live matters. How we treat people matters how we lead how we live and how we love it matters because the bible says without holiness that no man shall see the father now church i want to be abundantly clear i'm not talking about perfection because ain't none of y'all perfect including me praise god for grace but there's a difference between excusing bad behavior and genuinely striving to live for christ amen there, there is a different. I want you to notice now that all 10 were holy, all 10 were set apart, but not all 10 were ready and prepared. I want you all to notice that what points towards their foolishness or their wisdom, it was not their virginity, it was not their purity, it was not their standard of holiness, but rather it was their foresight to be prepared if the bridegroom was delayed and darkness preceded his coming. 
In this text, we discover that the wise prepared for his delay, but the foolish depended on his timeliness to make up for their laziness and their lack of foresight. And there are far too many of us that are just sitting on the back row, sitting on the back pew, sitting back and resting on our laurels and waiting until we think it's time for us to get right. The Bible says that today is the very day of salvation, not tomorrow and not next week. And I want to challenge all of us that there's going to come a time where you're going to have to make a choice. And church family, setting on the fence is a choice in and of itself. Are we going to serve Jesus or are we going to live by the ways of this world? As far as I'm concerned, even if Jesus does not come in my lifetime, that does not forfeit the power of his prophetic word. If God does not come in my lifetime and it's another 150 or another 1,000 years until the Lord comes, my life is not contingent on whether or not he comes in my lifetime because whether it be by death or by rapture, I will see my Savior face to face. But it's in this text that we discover that it was the wise that were prepared, but the foolish depended on his timeliness instead of depending on their foresight. The wise embraced the possibility of the bridegroom being delayed, but the fools refused to entertain the thought that the bridegroom could delay and that darkness would be around them that would hinder them from making their travel to the marriage feast whenever the bridegroom came to, came to call. I want to remind all of us today and I need for you to remember that all ten virgins saw the need for the lamps but not all ten virgins saw the need for the oil. In church family the oil is important. The oil of the Holy Ghost is important. The anointing of the Holy Ghost is important. We need the Holy Ghost. I thank God for the blood of Jesus. I thank God for my testimony. But Jesus said it is necessary. I must needs leave you to go to my Father in so that he might send you the promised helper that is going to lead and guide you into all truth. I thank God for the Holy Ghost. I thank God for the blood of Jesus and I thank God for the call of Christ the oil is important and we cannot just depend on our testimony for us to make it we've got to have the Holy Ghost tell your neighbor you need the Holy Ghost the oil is important point number two today the ten virgins all saw the need of waiting on the bridegroom, but not all ten virgins were prepared for when the darkness came to precede his coming. I want you to notice with me verses 5 and 6 found in this passage of text, as the bridegroom was delayed. I want to remind you of our text of last Sunday that a thousand years is as a day and, and a day is as a thousand years for the Lord. So according to the word of God, Jesus has only been in heaven about a day and three quarters. Come on, somebody. For us, it's a thousand years, but a day for the Lord is but a thousand years and a thousand years is but a day. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at the midnight, but at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. In these few verses, we discover that all were waiting for the bridegroom. All became drowsy. All fell asleep. And all heard the call. But what separated the ten into the two groups of five was the oil. It was not their willingness to fall asleep or their willingness to stay awake. It was not any of those other things. The oil made the difference. The unique facet of this text is this. Their virginity, their holiness did not remove from them their burden of humanity. Church family, I want to remind all of you today, including your mama-in-law and everybody else in them, that your flesh is potentially dangerous 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and even more so on Sunday. Come on, somebody. That we've got this thing called the flesh that we've got to deal with, and that's why you need the Holy Ghost. How many of y'all have typed up a text response or a post on Facebook and the Holy Ghost checked you and instead of you blessing them out, all you said was okay. Come on, somebody. Come on. 
The Holy Ghost doesn't just enable us to shout and speak in tongues. It also enables us to hold our peace when our flesh doesn't want to hold its peace. The Holy Ghost enables us to serve Jesus even when our flesh doesn't want to submit to the very Word of God. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. See, some of y'all don't even want to tell on yourself, but, it, but if it wasn't for the Holy Ghost, you would have made some foolish decisions this past week. You would have said some stuff that you didn't need to say, had some conversations w- with some folks that you didn't need to talk to, had a blow up in your house and said some things that you didn't need to say. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Their holiness did not remove their burden of humanity, but it was the oil that made up for their humanity, which allowed, which allowed the five to light their way and the other five to be left in the dark. And my question for you today is with the darkness that is coming, is there light in your lamp and is there oil in your flask? Are you going to be trapped trying to light your way with a lamp that doesn't burn? Or are we going to lean back on the auspicious blood and we're going to plead and ask for the Holy Spirit to enable us by the oil of the Holy Ghost to be able to burn this lamp on the inside of us to serve Jesus, to light our way home? It is my goal to make sure that every one of y'all leave today with your lamp overflowing with oil and a flask in your pocket. Some of us used to carry around flasks of whiskey. I want to challenge you to throw that away and get you a flask of the anointing all of the Holy Ghost in your pocket to be able to keep your lamp burning and to serve Jesus even whenever other people don't understand. I want to just help all of you including me today. It's not meant for everybody to understand you. My Bible tells me that we are to be in the world but not of it. And whenever people question us, isn't it amazing that whenever you live like the devil, everybody gossiped about you. But all of a sudden when, when you start serving Jesus, and living by the word you go from this to nothing more than a bible thumper and you're just a holy roller and you're just this and that my god i would much rather somebody identify in me that i'm a holy roller that is in love with jesus than go back to the state that i was living in the way that i was doing the stupid things that i was doing knowing that i was going to hell on on a fast track amway come on somebody i thank god that the holy ghost did not abandon me when i was doing things that I ought not do I feel the Holy Ghost today church family it is the anointing of the Holy Ghost that is absolutely necessary and needful we can lean on our intellect lean on our education lean on our life experiences lead on wisdom and counsel but there's a difference when the Holy Ghost gets involved because all of that goes from natural to supernatural We need the Holy Ghost to keep our lamps burning. We need the Holy Ghost to keep our lamps burning. And it's absolutely necessary and needful. You hear me today. It is needful if we intend on lighting the way when the bridegroom comes to call. I want you to say this with me. I need the anointing. I need the oil of the Holy Ghost. I need the Holy Ghost. Remember, all ten virgins... They saw the need of waiting on the bridegroom. Church, there are Christians of all denominations, all spheres, all philosophies, all theologies, and all doctrines that are waiting for the bridegroom to come. But not all ten virgins were prepared for the darkness to precede his coming. And I want to make sure I don't have any responsibility to pastor or shepherd any other church in this world except for this one. But as for us and as for this house, I want to make sure that we've got enough oil in our flasks and enough oil in our lamps to light the way through the darkness of this world that we would be willing to see Jesus come hell or high water for 2,000 years. The church of the living God has stood on the word and has demonstrated the very power of the Holy Ghost and it's not going to stop in this generation. 
We're going to see these young people speaking in tongues and prophesying and laying hands on the sick. And, and, and we're going to see the gospel go forward, not just because we as a church believe that it's true, but the Bible says that it is the job and the very responsibility of one generation to declare to the next generation the glories of God. This generation is not lost. This generation is going to be set on fire by the power of the Holy Ghost. All ten virgins saw the need of waiting, but not all ten virgins saw the value of preparing, of keeping their lamps burning and their wicks trimmed and their oil in their flasks. We need the Holy Ghost. Point number three today, Lord Jesus. I either need to get in shape or get an oxygen mask. Y'all pray for me. (laughs) Y'all be proud. I put my clothes on this morning and they're all loose. I'm like, well, praise the Lord. (laughs) Point number three. The ten virgins all fell asleep while waiting on the bridegroom. But not all ten virgins had the oil to light their way whenever the bridegroom came to call. I want you to notice with me verses seven and nine. Then all those virgins rose and they trimmed their wicks. And the foolish said to the wise, notice, the foolish said to the wise, the unprepared said to the prepared, give me what you have. Give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. Church family, it is our responsibility to pray, to encourage, to extol, to build a strong faith community, to love people through their weaknesses and through their strengths. But church, the only person who can build up their own oil reserve for themselves is themselves. It's each one of our responsibilities to ensure that the oil is in the house, that the oil is in the lamp, that the oil is in the flask that the oil is readily available. I can't do it for you and you can't do it for me. There's some of this faith walk that's required of you. Say me and not we. There are some things that we can accomplish together, but there's some things about this faith walk that it does not fall to we, it falls to me. It falls to you, it falls to me. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some oil for our lamps are going out. Notice they were now discerning enough because of their circumstance to see their need, but they did not have foresight enough to prepare for the need before it ever came. Isn't it interesting how this parallels with Noah's story? The Bible says that it wasn't Noah that closed the door. The scripture says it was God that shut up the door. Imagine being in Noah's position, having preached and prophesied for a hundred years that these things were coming and nobody listened. And then all of a sudden it starts to rain and the, and the rain begins to fall and the springs of the deep begin to breach forward. And those who had turned their ears ran to the door and began to knock saying, let us in, let us in, let us in. But notice at that point, not even Noah could open the door because God was done. And notice in this, give us some oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered them saying, since there will not be enough for us and you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourself. Church family, all 10 were virgins. All 10 were waiting. All 10 had lamps. All 10 fell asleep. All 10 heard the very midnight cry, but not all 10 had the oil to light the way. There's a difference between between being religious in our relationship and having partnership and our relationship with Christ. The oil is what separated these 10 virgins. It was the oil, and my question for all of us today is do you have the oil? Is there oil in the house? If you'll go back and you'll look in in the Old Testament, it tells the story about the woman who was about to lose her sons, and she calls for the prophet to help. 
And the prophet says, how many jars do you have in the house? She goes and she finds every jar that, that she can. And that prophet gives her a word and she starts to pour the oil. And notice, the oil only stopped flowing when there was no more void to resource. And she took the oil and she liquidated her debts and she saved her sons for slavery, from slavery. And my question for all of us today is how many voids are in your life that you've not let the oil into yet? How many bondages and secret sins and things that only you and Jesus know about that you're well enough to pray about it, but you're not strong enough to repent about it? How many of us approach prayer from asking God to help rather than asking God to help us repent? There's a difference between praying to God about something and being willing to repent of that thing. And that's when we make room for the oil to pour into the voids of our life and begin to fix some things that you and nobody else has the power to fix. Church family, he's a helper for a reason. He's a helper for a reason. He helps us in our what? In our weaknesses. He helps us in those areas that we can't fix. He has the power to bring order and correction to the things that we can't conquer. He's enabled to bring healing to areas that we cannot resolve in and of ourselves. And my question for all of us today is, do you have the oil? Have you let the oil in your life? Have you let the Holy Ghost begin to deal with some of those things that... Some of us are too comfortable entertaining our pigs. Notice the demons had no problem running into the pigs or the swine whenever Jesus cast out those demons of the man of Gadara. But you notice the community's response. They had no concern over the man that they had bound in chains because Jesus destroyed their pigs. And how many of us have, have become concerned with other people, but we don't want Jesus messing with our pigs? We want Jesus to fix them, but we don't want Jesus to mess with us. We want Jesus to change them, but we don't want to give the Holy Ghost the right to speak into the things that you need to have absolvence from. Why do you think Jesus said this? He said, why do you judge your brother over the speck in his eye and you got a tree growing out of your head? Right? We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost to get some planks out of our eye, to get some junk out of our life. Jesus had no problem with, 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 with judgment and correction, but he did have an issue whenever it was perverted justice, perverted judgment and abuse. We need the oil today. The oil is what separated the ten virgins, and I firmly believe that it is the oil that will be the separating factor of the forthcoming, catch, of, of the forthcoming catching away of the upcoming return of the bridegroom. But as for me, come on somebody, and as for this house, so far as it lies within me as the pastor of this great church, we will make room for the oil. We will see the value of the oil. We will have the anointing oil of the Holy Ghost in this house. We will have authentic moves of Pentecostal expression, not because we're trying to, to, uh, to, to, to impress other people, but rather because of this. I know who I am apart from him, and I know who I am with him, and I I much rather have the person who is with him than to be apart from him. Come on, somebody. We will have the power of God demonstrated in this house. We're going to have all in the house. I shared with, with a person I prayed for this morning. I grabbed the oil and I poured it. And said, some of y'all have seen this. Poured that oil all in my hand. I don't believe a dab will do you. Come on, somebody. I pray the, listen, I baptize my chicken before I fry them. Come on, somebody. The oil is important. 
Some of y'all going, please finish so I can go to KFC today. <laughs> Is everybody all right? Shout amen. amen. I want you to remember that all 10 virgins fell asleep. Church family, you are human. Yes. So nice. You're human. You're not perfect. You're going to slip up. I hate to break it to you. This is breaking news headline ticker across the bottom of your TV. Life happens. Things go wrong. It's okay. You're going to be all right. It's not about being perfect. It's about being in love. Church, there is no perfect marriage, including mine. At this point, my wife reserves the Congressional Medal of Honor and the Congressional Medal of Jesus for putting up with me for 17 years. And now she's having to raise a two-year-old that's a miniature version of me. I will visit the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth. Hey, come on. We're going to fall asleep. We're going to have moments when our humanity gets in the way. Don't elbow your wife or your husband today. I'm talking to everybody. But what does it say? All ten fell asleep, but only five of the ten had the oil to light their way when the master came to call. Point number four, and I'm getting ready to close, if I can have my musicians to come. The ten virgins were all waiting for the bridegroom, but it was only the ones, excuse me, but it was only the ones with the oil that made it to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm going to say that again. The ten virgins were all waiting for the bridegroom, but it was only the ones, shout it with me, with the oil that made it to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm not telling you that you got to pray in tongues and prophesy and do and manifest gifts to make it to heaven. My Bible tells me that if we believe in our heart and and declare with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that we will be saved under the day of redemption. But church, say it with me. Only the ones with the oil made it. All 10 were waiting. All 10 were watching. But only half of them had what it took to light the way. And my question for all of us today, including myself, is is there enough oil in you to make it? Jesus said this. He said, those that endure, say it with me, until the end, the same shall be saved. And that endurance part is not you motivating you to have enough strength to endure. That's coming to the end of yourself. Like the Apostle Paul said, I pled three times for the Lord to take this thing away from me. And every time he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Why? Because my strength is made perfect in your weakness it's not that God finds glory in your weakness the Bible says let the weak say I am strong Christ does not find glory in your weakness Christ finds glory when you come to the end of yourself and realize that you can't do this alone that you can't shoulder the weight by yourself, that you can't shrug off the burden of sin by yourself, that you cannot be the husband or the wife or the father or the mother or the whoever that you need to be apart from him. He finds no glory in our weakness. His glory is made manifest when we come to the end of ourselves and realize, I cannot do this 
alone. Whether that be for man or woman, that causes us, forces us, puts us in a place to where we have to crucify our pride and go in and of myself, there is no good thing. For apart from Christ, I am nothing. The bottom line is this, and you all need to hear me today. To seek the oil after the door is closed is futile. To pursue the oil of the Spirit after the Master has already come to call is pointless. Could this parable give us insight to why Jesus said, many shall say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out devils? Did we not lay hands on the sick? Did we not prophesy? And Jesus says, on that day, I will have to tell them, depart from me. You what? You worker of iniquity, for I do not know you. Could it be? Notice Jesus never questioned whether they did those things. He questioned the intent of those things. And for all of us today, I want to ask you, is the oil a priority? Is the oil a priority? Because if it's not, you need to make it a priority. We cannot make it. As Jesus said, those who endure to the end. Church family, there is nobody in this room, including me, that in and of ourselves can endure to the end apart from his spirit. We've got to have the oil. And there are many of you in this room that you need to allow the oil of the Spirit to begin to permeate into some areas of your life, even those areas that you are ashamed of. A failed marriage, a broken relationship, a history of substance abuse, anxiety or depression. Let me tell you something, the Holy Spirit is not ashamed of you. As a matter of fact, my Bible tells me, James Townsend, in Acts chapter 2, it said when the Holy Spirit came, that it was a rushing mighty wind. That tells me that the Holy Spirit made such a priority on the outpouring that he was running as fast as he could to get to his destination. That apart from all of the shame and brokenness and bad decisions of those 120 people in that upper room, the Holy Spirit still was rushing. He was running. He was accelerating as quickly as he could to get to them because he knew just how much they needed him and today the Spirit of God is rushing to meet he's rushing to fill. he's rushing to pour the oil out in my question for all of you today I, I want to challenge all of us today it's time to pull back the layers of our life and let the Holy Spirit begin to pour in to those areas of shame and those areas of condemnation and those areas of brokenness because I'm going to tell you something you may be ashamed of those things but the Holy Spirit is not ashamed of you Jesus has no problem identifying with tore up people because at the end of the day he's the only one who can take tore up folk and make them some holy folk he's the only one who's able to take the broken shards of our life and put us back together church family the ten virgins were all waiting the church is waiting but it was only the ones who had the oil that made it to the marriage supper of the lamb and I want every person under the sound of my voice today to make it to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I want every single person in this room, including you that are watching online and TV and every other platform that we use, I want the Holy Spirit to be outpouring in your life on a daily basis. You need the oil. Church family, I could not pastor if I didn't have the oil. I could not lead in his church if I did not have the oil. I could not get enlightenment from his word if I did not have the oil. The oil is important. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. 
a lamp. Your word is a lamp. We need the oil today. I want all of us. My Bible tells me according to John's prophecy in the book of the Revelation that he saw a throne set upon a crystal sea. And my Bible tells me that every tribe, that every kindred, that every tongue, and that every nation was around that throne praising the Lamb who was slain and bringing glory unto the Father. But they made it there, not by happenstance. They made it there because they had the oil. And I want to see, I want to see every person. The Bible tells me that I should guard over, this is what the scripture says in Peter's, in one of, I think it's 2 Peter. He says, guard the flock of God that was assigned to you. And as your pastor, I want to see you. You want to know what the greatest gift to me as a pastor will be in eternity? It will be to see the ones that I held their hand in the broken seasons of their life in glory. Not giving glory to me, but bringing glory to the Father. The greatest testimony to my ministry will not be the church that I build or the budgets that I do, none of that. The testimony to my ministry will be those whom I shepherd as far as it lied within me that they had the all to make it. That the Holy Spirit was equipped in them to walk them through the difficulty of life that they thought was not possible to endure. Church family, the all makes the difference. The all makes the difference.